Disingenuous Activists, Why Leerless Resistance is Preferable to Formal Organizations, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on April 14th of 2016, read to you by the author. Quote, Avoid membership in political groups or other civic organizations. As a rule, these groups are filled with super sneaky, nosy individuals, more willing than not to stab someone in the back if it suits their selfish purposes. Total snakes. End quote. Barry Reed. People ought to collaborate whenever they can in order to achieve their goals. Individuals who become familiar with each other have the potential to develop a molecular level bond of trust, which is essential for the smooth operation of any activities they may choose to perform. However, joining a formally organized activist group, much like using suspicious email keywords or custom aluminum warning signage, is usually more trouble than it's worth. Populism is usually the driving force behind activists who feel the need to organize, whether it be nationally or in their local communities. This democratic impulse is typically based on the assumption that the theory of critical mass is valid, despite all historical evidence that suggests foundational change is normally caused by relatively few people, as is the case, for example, with a coup d'etat. The reason socio-political movements rarely achieve their stated goals is, more often than not, due to the simple fact that with the greater adoption of their professed values, their principles become diluted as the sheer number of self-identified adherents grow. This is the source behind the derisive phrase, cultural bowel movement. Truth be told, populism is really just another form of collectivism. Whether the specific context is nationalism or egalitarianism, the operating presumption is that we are all in this together, whatever that may be. All too often, Reformism becomes the modus operandi, thereby leading its practitioners down the road to perdition. As Larkin Rose has said, Most activism is completely worthless. In fact, it's worse than completely worthless. It accomplishes more harm than good. And while I'm at it, I'll say I speak from experience. Uh, many, many years ago when I still believed in statism, I was politically active and I campaigned and I I, I played those games and I wrote to my congressman and did all that stuff. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it now, but yeah, I did that too. And at the time, I really and truly believed that I was fighting the right fight. I was fighting against the beast. Um, it only occurred to me many years later that actually I was feeding the beast lots and lots of fuel. This rather profound insight shows the gaping hollowness permeating formally organized activist groups. How can reflexively spouting that education is the answer to every single problem be true if such education is rampantly littered with misinformation and disinformation. If political field trips are to serve any useful function, it is that the exercise of this technique will break the back of populism's legitimacy within the minds of its victims. Once you personally witness Leviathan, under normal circumstances, acting within its own natural habitat, the sheer horror that is the daily routine of government will also become equally apparent in the politicking that is all too common within organized activist groups as well. In short, formal activist organizations are a reflection of the state itself, especially considering their top-down organizational structure with regional chapters who report back to their centralized headquarters. Whether it be labeled the Patriot, Liberty, or Truth Movement, those individuals who demand more freedom usually attempt to organize themselves in the hope that doing so will serve as a force multiplier. Presuming this were true, then what could possibly explain when the polar opposite, as a matter of course, becomes the typical result? The history of contemporary activist organizing suggests to me that ulterior motives, especially when coupled with a naive misunderstanding about how an organization seeks to achieve its stated goals, creates an atmosphere of disingenuous rhetoric and moral hypocrisy. Consider for a moment when the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association publicly issued those letters written by county sheriffs 
who voiced their opposition to the federal government's proposed unconstitutional gun control measures back in 2013. Similarly, was the Tenth Amendment Center successful in nullifying unconstitutional federal actions vis-a-vis -vis the passage of HB 910 right here in Texas last June? Are the three percenters truly going to protect America on the off chance that the Schumer hits the proverbial fan? I'd suggest that CSPOA's release letters simply reinforced a misunderstanding about the viability of constitutional sheriffs in securing the right to keep and bear arms, that HB 910 had nothing whatsoever to do with TAC's advocacy of state nullification, and that the Idaho three percenters will flee at the slightest sign of real danger as they did last February when they abandoned the final four at the Malaher Refuge into the waiting jaws of the FBI. In 2009, Luke Radowski solicited donations intended for a legal defense fund on behalf of himself and two other members of We Are Change to the tune of $4,241.55 that still remains unaccounted for in clear violation of the WAC Code of Conduct. During 2013, Adam Kokesh's employees never accounted for the check that George Donnelly sent Adam versus the man for $5,431.58, despite that they never disputed the fact that Donnelly had already sent AVTM 4.5002619 bitcoins and 120.5 litecoins, approximately 450 and $284, respectively. Speaking of Bitcoin, Coin Center and the Bitcoin Foundation are quite fond of building relationships with federal regulators who desire to centrally plan every facet of life from cradle to grave. When I attempted to warn Bitcoiners about this last year, few of them seemed to give a damn. The lack of righteous indignation truly does mean, at least to my mind, that the silence is deafening. No wonder Bitcoin developer Mike Hearn quit. Also in 2013, Christopher Cantwell was formally ostracized from the Free State Project by its Board of Trustees for reminding everyone of their common right of revolution, which is enumerated in Article 10 of New Hampshire's Bill of Rights. Later that year, it was revealed that none other than Free Keen's Ian Bernard was the individual who encouraged the FSP board to scrutinize the rhetoric of Larkin Rose, as if ritualistic purges are necessary in order to rid the party of assorted undesirables. Not only did Cantwell and Bernard have their own falling out last year, but once the FSP reached its goal of 20,000 signers to the non-contract, that is the statement of intent earlier this year, they were all too quick to formally ostracize Bernard himself, oh so conveniently a mere three days before the FBI raided Bernard's home in Keene. Why anyone would bother paying for tickets in order to attend Liberty Forum or the Porcupine Freedom Festival, also known as Porkfest, or otherwise continue donating money to the FSP in light of their treatment of both Cantwell and Bernard is truly beyond me. Even Bernard, of all people, didn't deserve that kind of treatment, given that in this country, there is such a thing as the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Yes, it is true that I have advocated for a boycott of Free Talk Live for two years now, and still do. But how Bernard was demonized here is beyond appalling, especially considering it is a well-known fact that Bernard was the FSP's most successful recruiter. Once the FSP board had achieved their fake goal, they were all too quick to cast him out into the cold alone to be at the mercy of the government's wolves, weren't they? During the Bundy Affair of 2014, the Oath Keepers attempted to pick a fight with the various militia units, many of whom responded to a call-out by Operation Mutual Aid, now known as Operation Mutual Defense. When the fake drone strike occurred, the Oath Keepers fled and left the women and children at the Bundy Ranch to suffer what thankfully never transpired. Yet, in the aftermath of the 2015 Chattanooga shootings, Operation Protect the Protectors was launched, in order to have people stand guard at the military recruitment stations, despite the evils committed by the warfare state. 
This is why they are now derisively referred to as the Oath Breakers, not to say how they also conveniently abandoned Charles Dyer, who was their U.S. Marine liaison. Between 2014 to 2015, the absorption and dilution of the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership by the Second Amendment Foundation was outright scandalous. Alan Gottlieb disgraced Aaron Zellman's legacy thoroughly, so it is no exaggeration to say that the JPFO sellouts on the Board of Trustees offer their organization up on a platter to the SAF without so much as consulting their membership at all. The transfer of the rank-and-file membership's personally identifiable information from JPFO's mail lists to the SAF without their consent is a grave breach of security culture, to say the least. Similarly, in terms of violating privacy, Mark Kessler's 3% boots on ground and constitutional security force tricked some American patriots into filling out a rather invasive application for membership. As Gary Hunt described it, quote, Nearly every person who joined the 3% BOG completed and sent to Kessler an application sufficient in detail to positively hundreds, perhaps thousands, who joined his organization. The information requested is far more extensive than you would fill out for a job and includes questions that are appropriate for psychological evaluation or profiling, close quote. When Kessler outed himself as a government informant on the December 2nd, 2014 broadcast of the Alan Combs show, this confirmed he was serving as a non-sexual honeypot of sorts. According to Hans's partial transcription of that interview, Kessler admitted the following. How many people would you say came out of the woodwork or how many groups came to you as a result of the bait that you threw out there? Thousands and thousands and thousands. They have no idea. Uh, and you what turned them over to the feds? Well, what, what my job was is to find out if they were dangerous or not. Uh, if they were a dangerous group or deemed a threat to society, well, then we took care of business. How is your name not attached to this? So you don't want to tell us what agencies, where you got this information, who you did it for? I was, uh, I was intel. I was strictly intelligence. So where can intel the for. citizens go to get to see the results of this? I mean, is there any place we can learn more about my part again my part is finished with it uh i'm not at liberty that i can't reveal what agencies that i was working will there at. be a time when you will be able to reveal that uh yes there will I i'm i'm sure there will be later on but right now there's still pending investigations going on and i cannot reveal uh, what's going All on right, so notice that kessler admitted he had engaged in unjust profiling on the thinly veiled excuse that such targeted individuals were deemed a threat to society. So, if you were to put together the invasive questions on the 3% BOG membership application, which is rife with misspellings, with Kessler's very public confession, I think it is more than safe to say that Kessler was quite disingenuous towards those individuals who consider themselves patriotic militiamen. Not that joining a formally organized activist group is a one-way ticket to a government dungeon by any means, for it is also equally possible that they will lead you by the nose through sucking time and money away from you with your consent, simply because you believed in their pablum. Texans for Accountable Government, TAG, has really gone downhill in recent years. Yet, I remember when John Bush really worked that group as its executive director. Although the charismatic Katie Brewer and the wonderfully firebrand Heather Fazio were still there as of last year, I doubt even they can rescue it from Justin Armon and his reformist allies like Dr. Laura Presley, nor should they. Off-grid homesteaders are not immune from the corrupting influence of other activist organizations. For the fate of the SLV Just Us group in Costilla County, Colorado last year, testify such to be the case. They were able to withstand the pressure from both the Costilla County government and the bigoted Hispanics within the town of San Luis. But when Operation Patriot Rally Point rolled on in, the homesteaders were balkanized so badly they were unable to recover. As Alex Ansari had commented three days after the disastrous Meet the Judge event, And I will never trust certain people to vet certain people. 
forever from this point on. It is irresponsible to assume other people will just do the vetting for us and vet certain members and make sure that they are who they say they are. Well, that wasn't done. And, and no group or community can be fully safe if people are so naive that they don't even bother to question or look up the supposed people that are coming to the rescue. This rather harsh truth illustrates the fact that when activist organizations clash, the fallout is bound to be a degradation of solidarity, not a reaffirmation of it. Just because people have grievances and are seeking remedies to alleviate them, does not therefore mean that such proposed techniques are effective at remedying those grievances. When there is a difference between activists regarding strategy and tactics, it is a fait accompli that the sparks will fly, thereby leading to schisms and overall fracturing, unless interpersonal diplomacy takes place quickly in order to mitigate friction. Sometimes the breakdown will not occur as a flashpoint, but rather as a slow deterioration. The Williamson County Libertarian Party, WCLP, never had the membership who attended its meetings like TAG did, and it carried along with it the additional baggage of not only partyarchy, but also the confession made by the National LP founder David Nolan in 2008 about the monster he had created. We have unfortunately created, or the party has created, a, a little class of, of mini-bureaucrats who are more concerned with keeping their job and perpetuating the institution as an institution and raising money than they are with spreading the message. When we started out, our goal was to, to spread the word about, was sort of evangelical, I guess you could say, to spread the word about liberty out into the, into the world at large. And we had people like Murray Rothbard and John Hospers and many other distinguished thinkers of that era involved in the party. Now we're down to the level of people who are, I think, for the most part, well-intended, but are, compared to those men, are, you know, several orders down the intellectual scale, and they're absorbed with minutia, they're concerned with budgets and fundraising, and they're afraid to say anything that might scare people because that might keep people from voting from us. So it's become a very timid organization in the last six or eight years. When you additionally consider that the WCLP's own Robert Butler brazenly took credit for something neither he nor the WCLP did last year regarding a few red light traffic cameras, then the disingenuousness of the anti-libertarian libertarian party oozes forth becomes rather apparent, as was also the case with Shane Radleff's political field trip to a meeting of the McLean County Libertarian Party last year. The latest of these organizational travesties is the bickering amongst sovereign citizen groups, most notably the Continental United States of America and the National Liberty Alliance. As you may remember, the latest sovereign citizen trend has been for some of them to become fake judges and then convince others that they are the same as the flowing black-robed men. Bruce Doucette, specifically, balkanized the SLV Just Does group, as well as inserting himself into the statist turf war not too long afterwards. Assuming that the rule is that formal activist organizations are not conducive to your freedom or privacy, then what would be the exception to that rule, if any? Organizations such as the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, HSLDA, the Texas Homeschool Coalition, THSC, the Institute for Justice, IJ, the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, LVMI, and the International Society for Individual Liberty, ISIL, seem to have a few traits in common. Either they are purely educational, as is the case with FEE, LVMI, and ISIL, or they are engaged in some form of legal activity, like what THSC, HSLDA, and IJ do. Of course, when evaluating the purported accomplishments of any formally organized activist groups, it might become useful to compare them to those similar activities by individuals whose efforts are directly parallel. The New Hampshire Liberty Alliance has produced liberty rating reports for 12 years now about the New Hampshire General Court, Yet, I would suggest that Chris Cantwell's Anarcho-Lobbyist series is noticeably more transparent and without all of the overhead. 
although the FSP imagines itself as having accomplished 20,000 signers, it would seem to be the case that people are flocking in droves into the American readout, as well as the American West more generally. The best transparency for this comes from John Schmidt and Alex Ansari, respectively. More importantly, the violations to security culture posed by activist organizations is staggering, whether it be due to snitches, data mining, snitch jacketing, doxing, false accusations of stealing from legal defense funds, or potentially even at losing your job, joining most activist organizations will likely increase your opportunity costs at the very least and reducing your freedom at worst. In other words, all things being equal, it is more than fair to say that activist organizations are more trouble than they are worth. Leaderless resistance is the best alternative to formal organizations, from what I know. Briefly, Leaderless resistance enjoys the traits of affinity consensus, mutual aid, and plausible deniability. In other words, simplicity, flexibility, and privacy. Applications of leaderless resistance include security teams, freedom cells, and even the alternative media itself. As I've mentioned in the past, everything I've done to free myself has been done either alone or in concert with other individuals through fluid, peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Formally organized groups are much too top-heavy in practice, and in fact, impose drastic opportunity costs upon their memberships. By contrast, leaderless resistance is, I think, the best approach to organizing libertarians and other individuals, whether the purpose for doing so is a business cooperative or monkey-wrenching. Top-down, hierarchical groups get infiltrated, whereas interpersonal relationships are really only susceptible to blackmail and extortion, at most. This makes them noticeably harder to penetrate and disrupt. Organizations don't matter, but relationships do. Formal activist organizations, when all is said and done, end up destroying any semblance of solidarity. Celebrity gatekeepers effectively neutralize grassroots movements for the benefit of the enemy. And in this respect, those celebritarians and patriot rock stars are little different from the Volksdeutschers in Nazi-occupied Poland. The only real purpose for these formally organized groups and movements is not to accomplish their stated objectives, but rather to provide an advertising brand that its membership will self-identify with and donate money to by feeling good about doing nothing productive at all. Activist organizations are highly overrated in their efficacy for securing individual liberty. Too many of them are organized like a pyramid, and if Americans are going to enjoy liberty within their lifetime, then that pyramid must be flipped upside down. Truly grassroots organizing means doing so from the bottom up. Whether organizing models like the emerging local committees of safety or libertarian grassroots entities such as Liberate RVA and the Houston Freethinkers are worth anything in this modern age remains to be seen. Yet, it is my hope that upon further investigation, these different ways of coordinating human action as the purposeful behavior that it is will yield an answer. You've just heard Disingenuous Activists, Why Leaderless Resistance is Preferable to Formal Organizations, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on April 14th of 2016, read to you by the author. 2048, the second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. 
Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the State Zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the Trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the Trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Under Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom. Vanu means relative physical invulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, Indirectly, you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. Out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live. By people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.